Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I see everyone joining us here today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you're here for an Investing in Future for Everyone webinar, and this is an AMA with startup experts from ICA, who I'm very excited to introduce you to. Um, my, who am I? Well, I am Rachel Shepard, Director of Global Marketing at Founder Institute and the co-creator of the Female Founder Initiative. The Founder Institute is the world's largest pre-seed startup accelerator, having helped launch over 5,000 companies across 200 cities and six continents. If you're interested in learning more about us, you, um, we're currently enrolling across all six continents. You can go to fi.co slash enrolling. Um, today, we're here to, uh, we have an amazing panel, um, especially if you're a coffee company, we've just been chatting. And if you have, if you're, if you're making something related to coffee, we are your people. Uh, we are, <laughs> we've all just been discussing that, but in all seriousness, we're here to, um, with an amazing panel from ICA, which is based in the Bay Area, uh, to get some questions answered regarding investing, impact investing, what do they look for in startups, all different types of things. So if you're a startup and you're an early stage startup, please do ask your questions in the chat today. So I have uh, my amazing team member, Felicia, is in the chat and she will be um, bringing your questions over so that we can get everything answered for you today. And really, we're here for you. So let's make this a great conversation. Um, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our panel. First up is Willis Wilson. He's the portfolio manager at ICA. Willis is an impact investor and portfolio manager. Previously, he served as the investment and growth strategist at Alpine Software Group and a consultant with ASG's legal tech vertical. Both domestically and abroad, Willis has advised early stage startups on building strong business models, product positioning, accessing capital, and exit opportunities. Willis earned his bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley, where he was an active member of the UC Berkeley entrepreneurship and technology community. Welcome, Willis. Is there anything you'd like to share with the audience? No, thank you. Uh, th great introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Next up is Diana Tremblay, Chief o Program Officer at ICA, responsible for the operational scaling success and mission alignment of ICA's programmatic offerings. Diana believes that small businesses are the fuel of our economy and are the most effective change makers in our community. Diana's mission is to leverage all available resources to support their growth of high potential, but often overlooked entrepreneurs as they scale their business. Welcome, Diana. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Awesome. And last but certainly not least is John Goh, Chief Investment Officer at ICA, responsible for ICA's seed capital strategy, investment and loan portfolio, and oversees the development of ICA Growth Fund. John's investment career spans over 20 years, including international banking, corporate finance, and impact investing. Prior to ICA, John founded a registered investment advisory business focused on impact and essential services investing hedged with alternative assets. Currently, John is focused on utilizing capital to build and grow businesses, fund good jobs, and create inclusive wealth opportunities for workers and the gender and racial equity gaps. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for being here with us today. It is great to be here. Hello, everyone. All right. Awesome. So without further ado, we'll just jump right into some questions and start really understanding, um, you know, sort of investments from the mind of our wonderful panel today. So first up, let's go ahead and start with Diana on this one. So for startups in the audience, Diana, finding investors can be challenging. How do you evaluate startups in the ICA community and pipeline? And how do you determine uh, if they're right, the right fit for your investment? Yeah, for sure. I will first say it's a group effort across many teams, both the program side and the investment side. And we're really looking for companies that are first aligned with our mission of closing the racial and gender wealth gaps by offering wealth building opportunities um, to their employees. We're also looking at the viability of the company. So first you have to have a company that works and that the business model is sound and can be sustainable over time. Um, and really uh, looking at the entrepreneur as what is their um, growth ambition? How do they want to grow the business? How are they aligned with us in that way? And of course, you know, it's always like the, like I said, the financials, really understanding the business model. But for us, it really comes down to um, really the social impact a company can have with us. And as far as um, the, the impact of the scaling impact a company can have in their own community as well. And Willis and John, you can, if I forgot anything. That's great. Um, yeah, one thing I just want to emphasize is maybe, the things we don't look at uh, when we evaluate startups. Um, we don't pull credit reports. Uh, we don't look for personal guarantees. Um, we don't look at collateral. Um, and so we're really focused on the entrepreneur and the founder. 
um, the work that they've done with, with ICA. Uh, we're looking at the cash flow and the underlying businesses. We're looking at the grit and the uh, resilience of those founders over time. So those are some of the key things that, that ICA is focused on. Yeah, and I guess one like last thing to add is that we invest in founders in a variety of ways. So in addition to having you know, our seed fund for earlier stage businesses with limited traction, our growth fund that invests up to a million dollars in underrepresented founders, um, we also have a loan fund. Um, we work with the California Building Fund as well. So we provide debt and equity capital and we try to meet the founder where they are, especially um, if we think they're making um, a meaningful impact in uh, the industries they serve or within their, their team. So you can think of a company like Go5, which addresses inequality in the sports industry and has a completely you know, woman-led team or a woman is a woman-led organization or a company like Something Better Foods, which is you know, doing some innovative things in the uh, alternative protein space and is completely you know, owned and operated by an African-American team and provides opportunities to employ or opportunities of employment for people that are generally um, left out or excluded from employment opportunities and leadership opportunities. So this is app. That's wonderful. And I, there, you mentioned so many awesome companies um, that, that, that uh, ICA has participated in, has supported in a variety of different ways. And um, if you haven't already, go check them out because I we were talking about so many before and both uh, myself and Felicia have a long list of shopping to do uh, from these wonderful companies that, that you've invested in and supported. Um, John, I want to circle back on something you said too about grit in the, fun, in the founding team. How do each of you identify a, a great team? So how do you measure for grit? How you know, how do you determine that a, a founder is going to be resilient or have grit? And, and, and what are the sort of intangibles you look for in a founding team? Um, sure, maybe I can kick it off. And by the way, a lot of the portfolio companies are behind me uh, with the logo. So um, uh, yeah, we, we put a lot of um, stake in the founder themselves. And grit is certainly a big part of it and resilience. And, you know, with, with the COVID crisis in 2020, um, we launched a rapid response liquidity fund, which provided 0% loans to founders. And it was really interesting. Um, you know, everyone was hit through this, through 2020 with the pandemic and companies in small businesses in particular were hit more than most, but it was fascinating to see how some founders were more resilient and some bounce back and some were able to diversify their revenue streams and their customer set, maybe move to e-commerce or, or diversify their suppliers or other things. And so that's something we look for over time is, is um, you know, the resilience and the growth mindset that, that a founder or entrepreneur might have in the face of, of what can be very trying times. I think the thing I would add to that is because the program team and the investment team work so closely together um, through programs, we're oftentimes able to see, um, you know, when you think about what does grit boil down to. It is the ability to hustle, is the ability to do a lot of things with very few things. Um, and it is the ability to just keep going. And a lot of times those things are seen as risky to other capital providers. So if you're going to a bank and you're doing 5 million different things to make things work, they're going to be like, no, you're not focused enough. Um, so one of those things that we're looking for is it, it might feel counterintuitive, for, but for us, grit is the ability to do so many things with so little, especially with underrepresented and underestimated founders where there are systematic barriers to be able to get what you need. Um, so I wanted to add that, that we're able to see that through programming and our programming also offers us a chance to help companies become more resilient in the first place. So we, we instill that into all of our programs and everything that we do. Absolutely. I think it's it's so important to, to be able to understand and, and get to know a team a little bit and see them, you know, kind of bring some creativity to the table when, when things get hard, um, because any founder will will meet roadblocks at some point, right? And it's a, so for founders in the audience, a great way to demonstrate that is to bring creativity, bring solutions and, and keep pushing, um, you know, even when things get a little bit challenging. And we know it's hard, but it is a great way to, to showcase to your um, investors or your potential investors that you you know how to keep going. Um, so one thing uh, I have to ask, and uh, Willis, let's kick this off with you. How can founders stand out to an investor? So as you're getting all of these cold emails, all these cold outreaches, as well as probably some warm intros as well, what are some things that stand out to you specifically? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we definitely, so we look at impact first, of course, and think about, you know, what the, the company is doing for both the communities they serve and for their own internal team. Um, so in that same vein, we look at, you know, the mission of the company, the vision of the company, the founder's background, but not in a traditional way. We think about the grit and the passion that the founders displayed um, since the inception of the company and before, like a lot of founders, you know, have experience in a particular industry, um, and then go on to do something in it. It could be food, it could be beauty, it could be, you know, anything. Um, so I look for mission, impact, some traction, because we don't look at all the traditional metrics like, you know, a Stanford MBA or, or things like that. We like to see that you um, proved out uh, a, a decent bit of what you believe to be true about your business and the, and the market that you're going after. Um, another thing is a team. We like to see a very diverse and representative team. We like to see ownership um, um, of the company by the members of the team and people. Um, have like decision-making power and influence on where the business goes. And um, something else I kind of look for is, is passion. And that comes out in a couple of different ways, whether it's the, the activities the founders done thus far or in the conversations, the mission for the company, um, et, et cetera. So I would say those are some of the, the key. John and Diana, anything in particular that stands out to you when you're evaluating companies? And, and, and thank you, Willis, that, that's, that's wonderful information for founders to have. But anything else that you guys would like to add regarding evaluating things that stand out um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're being outreached to for the very first time in particular. Yeah. Um, you know, Willis mentioned, um, the social impact that, that the founders and our entrepreneurs are making, and that's both in the community, but also with their own team, uh, and employees. And so, you know, we are, are looking at how the uh, founder is thinking about equity ownership, uh, with the employee base. Are they thinking about co-ops? Are they thinking about perpetual employee trusts? Are they thinking about other forms of wealth distribution that's wide and dispersed amongst their employee teams? You know, uh, and if it's earlier stage and maybe there's only a couple of employees, are they still thinking about that early on? And, and that's a really encouraging sign to us that they're thinking beyond um, and, and thinking about their community and the people that work for them. Absolutely. Community impact is really huge. Um, when it comes to, you know, what a startup can do. I think particularly right now, right, as we look forward to recovering from COVID, no matter where you are in the world joining us today, whether you're in the Bay Area with us or you're in, in Boston or Malaysia or Australia, we're all going to be, you know, sort of relying on our communities to recover. So mm -hmm. really kind of considering how startups play a role in that is, is really critical. So I, um, I want to ask Diana, as, as an investor, as, as, a, as, as a leader in ICA, how do you measure impact? How do you hold startups accountable as they grow to continue to have impact um, within the portfolio? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'll just, I'll, my preamble to this one is we're a nonprofit. So our impact is also measured. So we do a lot of like the, our funders measure our impact and in turn, we measure our companies that we work with impact. Um, and we do that in a couple of different ways. So, you know, one, we're of course looking at companies here in the Bay Area and, and how are they contributing to their communities? Are they creating jobs? What kind of jobs? Are those jobs accessible? If they're, you know, are there opportunities to be promoted? Are you stuck at entry level? Are you not? Like where are they hiring from within? Is there a diverse team? We're also looking at, as John mentioned, um, really wealth creation and what those opportunities are. And if you're not able to do it, because we understand that because it takes money to be able to do that and you have to grow your business, you have to create value. You have to wait for the value of the company to increase. Your net profit has to increase. Um, but do you have a plan? And is that your intent from the beginning? I mean, if it's not, it's not usually not people's intent because they don't know how to do it. They don't know where to start. So we really are looking at how do we support people to start that and how do we measure that over time? So every year we do send out surveys to our, our companies that we work with to get that information. So we're asking how much capital have you raised? How many employees have you had? How many folks have you promoted? Um, how many folks have you had to let go? Um, we're gathering a lot of information um, because we wanna make sure that we're staying true to our mission. And we also wanna be able to help the company stay true to their own mission, which is entangled in our mission. Um, so there's lots of ways that we we measure impact. Um, and sometimes it's a phone call. It might not be a survey. It might be a phone call and Willis is talking to a company that needs help and we gather information that way too. Um, so we gather in lots of different ways, but measuring impact is incredibly important for us. And it's, it's, it's um, I like to say it's how we pay back our funders and our investors. We pay back mm -hmm. in impact. That's wonderful. Um, and that's, 
super interesting too that there's this incredible focus on jobs because I think when we talk about impact at a at a global level sometimes we're talking about it often we're talking about it in regards to the UN sustainable development goals and these mm-hmm. sort of major major projects that the world is working toward um, which are incredibly important and um you know really worth absolutely worth investing tons of resources in and startups in and things like that but there are also very small ways that startups and 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 small yet very large and impactful ways that startups can go about creating impact within their business model and it sounds like jobs is a really big one for from ICA's perspective um Willis and John are there any other things that stand out to you um and, and that you look for in impact and, and hope um to measure for founders as well as they grow and scale? Yeah, I think they covered them all. So job creation, team diversity, access to opportunity, and diversity of ownership are always the, the things I look for when determining the, the impact of a company. Absolutely. That is so wonderful. Um, and I'm so excited too about team formation. Um, and I have a question and you know, maybe John, you can weigh in on this one too. Does that include as well, um, you know, sort of diversity across, of course, the founding team, but as well as advisors. Uh, and, um, you know, how, how do you measure sort of diversity across the team, especially as they're scaling and growing, um, you know, uh, and, and kind of pushing people to, to make sure that they're still doing everything they can to create diverse opportunities? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, Rachel, because we look at the leadership and the management and we want to ensure diversity across that, but we also are focused on ownership and the board um, and the equity ownership of the underlying company and is it diverse in that way. And I think it's important to really look at um, how wealth is generated with ownership and and assets and and see if it's diverse in that way as well. And and that's very important to ICA. Um, And we facilitate, um, you know, deeper, deeper ownership across um, the employee pool a lot of times through our investing. And, and, and so that is important. You know, you mentioned the UN Sustainability uh, Development Goals. Uh, one of our most recent investments, Willis mentioned, uh, was Goal Five, um, and they actually were not not an accelerator. I noticed one of the questions in the chat was, "Do you only fund to accelerator companies?" And and this company was was not in the programs team, but we had known the founder. And Goal Five stands for UN Sustainable Goal Number Five, which is for women's rights and women empowerment. Um, and it's a uh, apparel maker in women's sports. So uh, it ties directly to the, those UN sustainability development goals. Absolutely. I was checking out their website earlier today, as a matter of fact. Uh, oh, so that, oh, good. That's, that's, yeah, really cool. Because I, I, I saw that and I was like, immediately knew what it meant, right? That goal five was, uh-huh. was really about, um, uh, yes, and, and that's a great example of an apparel company that is really attacking a much deeper mission. Uh, and a much deeper level of impact, right, in 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 their community as well as um, you know a nation and, and and across the globe as well, I'm sure. Um, and so that's that's really fantastic. So um, one of the the other things I wanted to check in actually, uh, AI in the chat has a question about, um, as well as uh, investing in companies completely local to IC uh, to San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, it does ICA only invest in companies in the Bay Area? And what about relocation, which I think is an important uh, question for people in the chat, because I know we have people all over the globe. If they are have a base here, what does that look like for ICA and the polio? Um, uh, Willis, or, Willis, do you want to start with that one? Sure. So, yeah, so we div- um, invest um, solely, primarily um, in the nine county SF Bay Area. Uh, the question regarding uh, relocation, um, if you have a a hub or a headquarter here, but have a dispersed team that's other places, that, that's also fine. Um, but our, we look to, to, to invest primarily in the, in the nine county Bay area. I'll let John and Diana add a little bit. If they, if they want. I'm just gonna say the nine county Bay area is 101 cities. That's a pretty <laughs> large geography for us <laughs> to cover. So right. that's, yeah, but we've had companies who, um, less on the investment side, more on the support side, have been, have other places as uh, Willis said, they're other places, but they're headquarters or they have an office or they have a presence and they're, they are um, employing folks who are based in the San Francisco Bay area. That's the part that's, that's important for us too. Yeah. And I know Founders, Founder Institute has some incredible offices in Singapore and all over the world. I know that, um, 
you know, our, our charter with CDFI is focused on the nine county Bay Area, as Willis mentioned, um, but there are companies we work with. Um, I'm thinking about um, another coffee company um, <laughs> that has ties to Columbia. And I know someone in the chat is from, from Columbia and they work with local farmers directly, um, directly in Columbia. And this is a fourth generation Colombian uh, who comes from the, the coffee producing part of, 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 that, of that region and is in the Bay Area. So uh, the headquarters is in the Bay Area, but it does reach and extend globally. And I think that's an important part. Absolutely. And I would just add to, you know, to Diana's point, that's 131 cities in those nine counties. It's a big area. And there are a lot of areas outside of San Francisco. So, you know, it's the, the Bay Area is, um, you know, we're in all different sorts of places in the area right now. And it's a big, it's a big area of which you can um, join in and, and, and there's different nuances to the startup ecosystems as well. So I think everyone sort of thinks of Silicon Valley and which is really the thick of it um, uh, in terms of startups and technology, but there are lots of other areas around too um, and lots of opportunities to still have tremendous impact uh, in a community as well. Um, and impact abroad also, uh, which was a great example about the coffee company um, so other than coffee, which we've established we all love, um, what are some of the biggest uh, industries you're excited to see growing right now and you're focused on funding now? Diana, do you want to kick us off with this one? Yeah, ICA has a deep, deep, deep history in food and beverage manufacturing, like really deep. Um, we all love food that is influenced <laughs> who we work with and who we invest in. Um, end of the year holidays are there's lots of food around our office. Um, we're really excited around not just food, but food tech. Food technology is really exciting. Um, also really interested um, in you know, uh, health and beauty. So we have a number of health and beauty um, um, companies in our current cohort, which is really exciting because we're able to see um, these really high potential businesses who just need some support and some um, capital, and we're able to um, really support them. So I'm excited about food tech and uh, health and beauty. And then John and Willis can tell you what else we're excited about. Yeah, you, you hit all the good ones. Uh, I throw in CPG <laughs> in general as well, um, and maybe some apparel manufacturing as well. We have two uh, things coming up exciting there as well. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, we've, we've grown quite a bit. And as we've grown, we've been able to expand the number of industries we serve. And so, um, you know, focused on consumer products and, and uh, tangential industries to food and beverage, I think is an important direction we're going in. And technology is, you know, is embedded, them, is embedded in almost every industry now. So we're seeing a lot more um, in the technology arena as well. That is wonderful. Yes. And, and, and we established that we all love food as well, um, uh, or, or, you know, sort of in our pre-call. So food and coffee, there's a lot of opportunity here in the Bay Area to, to, to disrupt uh, that industry and integrate impact, which is awesome. Um, but uh, we have a question from the chat. Oh, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, Pad Benik uh, said, how, how do social impact entrepreneurs um, who are at sort of this early, early stage, really kind of access funds or, or, or how do they get creative when it comes to building their MVP um, mm -hmm. and then getting, you know, sort of the, the support and invest that they need after that to continue to grow their company. So um, uh, John, do you want to kick us off with this? So, so advice for founders who are trying to bridge that very important gap between sort of they, they have an idea, they've, they've established demand, but they're, they're looking for their MVP and don't and are and also need investments to to get to there. How, how does that how does that look for you generally speaking? And any advice for founders trying to bridge that gap right now? Yeah, um, and we actually launched a new um, a new workshop called the Lab, which kind of addresses this. Maybe Diana can kind of dive into that because we're trying to fill a gap that we we see the same thing. We're trying to fill a gap there. Um, and we think there's a lack of access to capital um, as well. Um, but, but Diana, do you want to talk about the lab a little bit? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so I'll do it from ICA perspective, which is general perspective too. So, you know, we, before folks, so we've been running our accelerator since 2016, but we've been doing advisory support consulting with small businesses uh, for the last 25 years. And when we launched our accelerator in 2016, um, you know, there's revenue minimums, there's years in business minimums, there's criteria to get into each program. And what we were seeing is that the companies that were really high potential often run by founders of color or um, female founders weren't getting to the spot we needed them to, to get to. And we needed some earlier intervention points. So what we did is we created a new program called the lab 
It's a um, four-week accelerator, really based on the fundamentals, but it's paired with our seed equity product. So we worked really closely with the investment team to create a um, seed equity product that's twenty-five dollars to $50,000 of equity. Um, not debt, equity, because there's lots of micro lenders out in the world. Um, and, you know, for us, that was the bridge that needed to be crossed. It was the, you have been, you know, your post revenue, you have a little bit of traction already, but you need additional capital to be able to, to really take off. You have that some semblance of an MVP, but you're still proving out your business model, but your high potential. So we created the lab and the seed equity um, product to be able to do that. And then outside of ICA, it really is knowing what's in your entrepreneur ecosystem. There's so many uh, resources um, out there for entrepreneurs, both online, in-person, play space. And really it's how do you figure out in your particular ecosystem and, and granted not all entrepreneur ecosystems are built the same or all at the same spot. There are some locations that don't have the ecosystem. So you're dependent on other spots and that's where online resources really, really do come into play. So I'm um, like, Hello Alice is a fantastic virtual online platform. There's so many resources in there um, from grants to early stage investing. So it really is globally understanding what resources are out there. And if you don't know, you can call or email someone like ICA and we will put you on the right path. There's lots of folks out there that are willing to help even if they're not a good fit for our particular services. Willis, John, anything to add? I was just going to say, Will Willis is an MVP, most valuable player, so he's got to have something <laughs> to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ready? Yeah, no, that, we're going to say that again. I think, I think you did a, a great job. You covered all the things I would have said around, you know, the seed equity program, how we also, oh, one thing we didn't talk about is how we provide additional support. So with the seed equity program, we have the lab that supports them along the way. So we don't just say, you know, here's 50,000, good luck. We say, we're going to support you, provide you coaching connections, um, in addition to capital to be able to help you get to that MVP and, and, and also learn more about your market, learn more about your customers and really put your best foot forward and put you on a path where you could get, you know, if you want more traditional VC style funding or a larger check from us, you know, up to, you know, a million plus or a million, I guess. Um, to, to continue to grow and further your business. And you bring up a really great point, Willis, which is, um, you know, as an investor, the I, ICA is is bringing to the table a lot of resources with it, but not all investments are the same and not all investments mm -hmm. um, sort of come in that fashion. And so as a founder, when you're building your um, cap table, basically, right, mm -hmm. and you're making room for people to make investments, is there a certain way in which you, uh, you know, recommend founders go about sort of um, identifying investors, uh, either, you know, very hands-on investors who are going to make key connections versus capital? Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah. Uh, step one for me, you're going to hear mission a lot from, from me, but uh, making sure that they're, they're mission aligned. You know, there, there's a lot of capital out there. A lot of people want to be in the venture capital, angel investing space, a lot of checks can be written, but making sure, um, especially when taking on equity, that you get the right partner, because of course you're giving away or, or, or maybe not giving away, but you know, selling part of your company um, in exchange for capital. And you would hope that it will come with something more that can be strategic to the further growth and development of your business. So kind of to go back to answering your, your main question, uh, definitely find a, um, a, an investor who's mission aligned and is a strategic fit for you and your org and understands where you're trying to go. Hopefully they have some industry expertise um, that they can share um, and, and guide you kind of along your journey. Now I know that that's not always accessible, um, but if you can help it, those are some things I, I would consider. Yeah, and maybe I'll just run through. I mean, just thinking about debt versus equity and the mm -hmm. capitalization table and what is the appropriate amounts you know, for mm -hmm. founders to think about. I think that's an important thing um, as you launch your business. And, you know, for, for debt, you want to ensure you're, you, you have a sustainable amount of leverage on your balance sheet. You don't want to be too levered. Um, you know, can, can the business with the cash flow that's generated repay that debt comfortably? And I think comfortably is the, the, the right way to think about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits um, to, to lower cost debt. Um, if the use of proceeds is a strong return on investment, because you're going to launch a new revenue channel or a new product, then there's a lot of value and you, you see a return on investment for that, for that fixed cost of debt. Um, 
and then on the debt side as well, thinking about short term versus long term. Mm-hmm. So I think you want to match up, you know, your the the use of proceeds. Is it a long term fixed capital investment like equipment or something? Then you want to try to find longer term, more lasting debt obligations um, to use to fund that business growth and expansion. Um, if it's more working capital, if you're just going to buy some inventory, for instance, then you want to get shorter term debt and match up, you know, try to match up your assets mm-hmm. and liabilities. Um, on the equity side, it's permanent capital, it's patient capital. If it's the right partner, um, you know, it could come with advisors and things like that. And, and that could be really valuable to the ongoing um, strength of your business. Uh, the con with equity, of course, is that you do give up a certain percentage of ownership um, as a result of, of that equity. And so um, that's just some of the you know, pluses and minuses when you think about your capitalization table and how you fund your business. Absolutely. That is super helpful for all the founders in the audience. Um, and, and you will get a recording of this, by the way. So in case you didn't catch all of that the first time around, all those lovely pieces of information John just shared with us, um, you can, you'll can you be able to check it out again. Uh, because that's really important to understand. And I think in particular, a lot of the founders in the audience are probably looking at a lot of pre-seed money right now, pot- potentially even like angel investment money. And I think it's, it's equally as important to um, assess your angel investors accordingly as well, right? Um, Particularly as an impact-focused, mission-driven company, um, because you want to make sure everybody's in alignment, uh, as Willis mentioned before. So um, one of the things I wanted to to follow up on, too, is, um, and Diana, maybe you can kick us off with this one, is any advice for founders on leading and building a strong culture around their mission impact? So we talked a lot about that in terms of fundraising, but as they're growing and scaling, keeping mission as part of a key component of a, of a growing company, especially one that's growing quickly, is, is very difficult. Um, and so how have you seen founders uh, successfully uh, navigate that? Yeah, I've seen it navigated all kinds of ways. I think, you know, successful, unsuccessfully, it just, you know, when you're in our rapid growth or even a strategic growth mode, like, it's not like you have to be putting like hiring 20 people a year or a month to like be thinking about how do you maintain your culture. It starts with when the founder first um, begins the, the company and the culture comes from the founder. So even if you don't, you don't say what your culture is, your culture will just be created spontaneously. And you want to make sure that you have some say in that because once a culture is created spontaneously, it is really hard to change it. So as a founder, you are the culture amplifier. You are the culture champion. And then as you're hiring, you have to find more folks that you're hiring that align with you in that way. And that can then be your culture magnifiers and amplifiers too. Because as a founder, you can't do it all the time. So if you're out raising capital, you cannot be the culture amplifier that whole time either. So it's really important to do that. And it's really important at the beginning to sit down and think about what kind of culture do I want to have? How do I want people to feel when they're at work? What do I want? How do I want people to talk about this place when they're talking about it to their friends, when they're trying to recruit? What are the different things I want to hear? And as I'm telling people about my company, what do I want them to hear? And how do I make that be a real thing? So, you know, when you create culture, it's there's things that cost money, um, like making like figuring out what your compensation philosophy is and figuring out the different bands. There's also things that are free. Giving feedback is free. Creating a culture of feedback is really important and creating a culture of really direct feedback that is kind and steeped in empathy is even more important. So I think it just boils down to really thinking about what do you want to create? How do you want people to feel? And how do you as the founder want to feel? Um, And having those culture amplifiers on your team that can also help you do that work. And building culture never goes away. Ever, 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 ever. You're constantly doing it every single day. That is amazing advice. Uh, and, and, And those are some great particulars to focus on as well and and to keep make sure you know maybe that's part of your weekly processes or what have you is to check in on culture check in on morale make sure you've created those feedback loops um i love that willis john anything to add on culture and mission alignment for founders as they grow and scale you know diane is a tough act to follow (laughs) um you know i don't know if i could add much um on top of what she said um she mentioned team which is the most important thing when I think about carrying the culture and making sure they, they hold you accountable to the mission and, and vision that you've set for your organization, same is true for having a board that also encourages and makes sure you stay aligned. So when ICA takes a board seat or sits as a board advisor, we look to serve as that, that social compass and say, 
wait, you know, you want to do X, Y, Z thing. What does that mean for the customers you serve and your employees and your team? Um, and so that, that's what I'll add. Fantastic. Yes. And it gets very top to bottom, right? Consider that for every person you bring in to, to help you grow and, and ultimately design your company and its future as well. And, and the impact in particular, I think it's incredibly important when you have a, an impact piece as a key pillar of your company. And I will say ICA walks the walk because I've spent 30, you know, I spent 30 minutes on the phone with this wonderful panel before we went live and I'm ready. I would like to be at your, uh, your, your company parties, you know, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely hang out in the future because uh, the culture, you can tell you guys all get along so well and the is definitely there. So, so ICA, you know, the advice Diana is, is giving is, I can tell is real and, and working within the, the organization already. Um, and so uh, I, I love that. Um, so for future of investing, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, John. ICA is investing in supporting small businesses as well as startups. How do you see these two worlds positively inting each other in the future? Yeah, um, it's it's really fascinating to think about that and the ecosystem that can develop. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do, and Willis mentioned advisory boards, and I know this, there's a question in the, in the in the chat as well about you know how do you establish an advisory board and some of those things. You know, one of the things we're trying to do to develop this cultural uh, consistency is to allow founders of one company to cross pollinate and sit on the advisory boards of other companies that are either coming out of the accelerator and maybe not not even funded by ICA, but need you know an advisor and need need a board member, um, or cross pollinate within companies that ICA is funded. And I think that's going to be an important thing, um, you know, for us for us going forward. Um, you know, people learn, you know, if, if you're an earlier stage startup, people, people then look toward the, the folks that came before them and want to stand on their shoulders. And, 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 and you know, and, and I think we have a lot of examples of that where, you know, like Firebrand Art, Artisan Breads, for instance, um, has a really interesting model uh, where they allow for some, some deep employee ownership and in and, and, and a structure that, that makes sense. And a lot of founders uh, have since tried to replicate that, um, and so we, you know, we see that when you talk about um, the future of investing and, and where you are in the various stages, you know, you know, we can see um, that the kind of that follow-on activity that's happening, um, and we want to uh, facilitate that and engender that and and get people thinking about that. And, and something I'll kind of add in to that is that we're really building an ecosystem, you know, of mission driven entrepreneurs and companies, you know, some of the businesses that start small will grow to be venture scale and, you know, and some of the businesses that want to go or think they have venture scale might not be, but we're building a, an ecosystem and believe that the founders will continue to help and support um, each other. Um, and we're also seeing some, some big things in, in, you know, like the increase in crowdfunding or different groups and things that are, more people are involved. So you think about, you know, you have an idea, you want to get it funded, you know, there's less dependence than there was historically on, I need VC dollars. You can go out, if you have a community, you can say community, you know, I'm doing this thing, you want to support me? You know, and a lot of times they answer with a loud, very resounding yes. Um, and we hope to build that, not just with the customers, but also with the ecosystem of founders who have unique experiences and are likely walking on the same trails, the same paths and can pay it forward and continue to build upon each other. Absolutely. You brought up a great point about crowdfunding being uh, a really unique way to um, sort of bridge that gap and kind of getting back to the other question we had earlier, too, of like that early funding opportunity. You know, if you have a community, especially if it's a consumer facing product, there's often those are your early adopters. It's also traction as you're building your funds as well. Right. Um, but, yeah, I absolutely see. Um, small businesses as, as well, sort of um, the definition, I think, of small business is going to change as we're moving, you know, into the, continuing to play in this hybrid virtual world that we'll be in for quite some time. Um, because I think small businesses and startups, I think, have been thought of as separate. But in the future, there's an opportunity for, you know, what, what many people think is they have a small business is actually a startup and, and vice versa. Uh, right. And to think about how that that plays into the community. And, you know, what's interesting is like the definition of what a small business is, is, is very different than what people often think of. People often think of like your main street businesses, your mom and pop shops. Um, but I believe if I'm not, you know, 
if I'm not mistaken, by the, the U.S. government definition is any business with under a certain number, a number of employees and under 50 million in revenue. There is some room for some sizable small businesses that can make some major impacts, you know, with a lot of these businesses. Uh, but I had experience with this in my, my last job where you, you don't think of like that in-between space where there are businesses, you know, with tens, hundreds, low millions of revenue. Then there are businesses with, you know, multiple tens of millions of revenue that aren't quite venture scale, but create great jobs, support great communities. Um, and are often not considered to be small businesses. So we think a lot of the businesses we support will also fall into that gap where they're doing actually some, some really significant business and creating some great opportunities, but still aren't quite venture scale because their market isn't long enough, large enough. Exactly. I'm, I'm excited to see that future for small businesses, especially as they create, you know, uh, multi-generational wealth opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Because I think, I think the idea before was that small business maintained, you know, revenue positivity and sort of maintained themselves and startups created these great wealth opportunities. And I think there's going to be a lot of space in between um, for, for a lot of communities to, to create opportunity that extends far beyond the, the here and now, um, but isn't, isn't quite giving up, you know, sort of going the unicorn route, I should say. Uh, and so that, that, that's really interesting. Um, and then uh, back to this one, Willis, Carolina asked, how many companies do you see in a year and what is the chance of getting funded just in general? So again, and I'd love for the founders to get a perspective of yeah. what your inbox looks like, you know, how, how, how often are you being reached out to in a, in a cold email? And then honestly, how many investments does ICA plan on making just so that they know what that funnel looks like? Sure. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. So, you know, we'll call it, you know, the, the new ICA is, is very active. Um, through our, our two programs, we'll do somewhere between 20 to 40 investments this year, um, some larger in the multiple hundreds of thousands, some lower using our seed equity fund of uh, 50K um, on average. Um, it just kind of, a, I guess, using some, some data, we've done, you know, four deals in the last four months, and we plan to keep that, that trend going. I get about maybe three to five emails a week from inbound from founders looking for funding. Um, they're not always a fit, but if they're not, we try to either send them to our programs or connect them with some other resources that can help. Um, what are your chances of getting funded? Um, assuming you have some traction, you kind of meet some of the, the basic criteria, being having a, a Bay Area presence, mission alignment, um, some traction, diverse team, et cetera. I would say um, it's a lot better than your chances with a traditional VC fund <laughs> um, instead of going like the impact VC route. Um, but it's just really hard to say. It's a case by case basis. We look really heavily for, for mission alignment, you know, traction, because we don't look at like the traditional metrics of, you know, MBAs and things like that, um, team and all those things. The market you're in matters, but not quite as much. We're not necessarily looking for unicorns, but you want to have a, a, a decent addressable market. Um, yeah, so that, that's it. Like I said we, we keep a running list of anywhere between 50 to 100, a pipeline, equity pipeline of 50 to 100 companies that are, you know, high potential. We rank them according to level of interest, documents collected, um, stage. Um, we track their participation in our programs. Um, and if, let's say, I get a company that, that reaches out to me and says, you know, I want, I need investment, et cetera. You know, I'll look at their pitch deck or whatever they send over. Sometimes it's their, their historical financials and projections. Um, and I'll say, okay, maybe not right now. Like you wouldn't be a legitimate, you know, fit for investment currently, but try this, just take a, or take a look at our programs. We think we can add value in these, you know, key ways and we'll definitely revisit it post and you'll come out of it, you know, everything in, in, in tow, your, your data room ready. I'm ready to really not just raise capital from us, but capital from, you know, our ecosystem of, of investors who invest in companies like the ones that we invest in. Wonderful. And that's, and thank you for providing all of that clarity. And I would say to um, can you go a little deeper on what is traction? So I know founders see a lot and they're here, they're being yeah. told like, I need to get traction. And they walk away, I, I because I've heard them tell me this, they walk away and they're like, I don't know what that means, you know, right. exactly what that is. And so um, I know it's industry specific in many mm. cases, but if you can give us some general idea, is that, um, you know, is that followers on a social channel? Is that an yeah. email list? Is that revenue? What does it look like for you? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for clarifying that. Something actually, some feedback we've heard um, or some some um, something we've heard from founders who are looking to raise from other investors is like, you know, investors always say, we need more traction, you know? And we're like, they're like, we gave them more traction and they didn't, they didn't invest. <laughs> and we're, we're like, you know, we understand that that's a very ambiguous term. Uh, for us, we look for at least a year in business. You have a product, you're selling it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to have some customers and have been in business for at least a year. Um, and that's that's what traction means. As there's no specific, uh, yeah, buzzword clarity, exactly. Uh, there, there's no specific dollar amount, um, but 
you know, it should be, okay, I guess I'm always going to be vague again. Let's, let's say low tens, low tens of thousands of dollars at least. Um, you have a product you're selling it at generating low tens of thousands of dollars on an annual basis. I like your low Damn. tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, at <laughs> least, at least, <laughs> at least low tens. And, and that'll qualify you more for like the lab and the seed equity, not so much yeah. the larger pools of capital. But um, it gets you in the door and it, it establishes that working relationship with us. And, you know, we support our businesses through and through. Once you're admitted to an ICA program or you get an investment for us, you're part of the family. And we do all that we can to support you. A great example, like John mentioned, is the rapid response liquidity fund, 0% interest loans, you know, to be people and businesses um, in our, or not people, businesses in our community, averaging $50,000, no credit check, no background check, none of these things that are traditionally um, barriers to getting capital. And a lot of the businesses we've supported um, are doing well and, and thriving and participating in our program continuously. They pay it back. We pay it forward and support additional businesses. So we try to, to um, be supportive. And if you come to us with that traction, you know, even if it's small, we try to make that mean something and, and um, help support you to grow further. Perfect. Thank you for providing clarity on traction and for giving us some numbers. I know it's hard uh, when it, we're not talking about specific industry or company, but mm. it really is helpful, I think, for founders to have some idea of what what, what does that mean to to any investor, um, you know, and, and and also just kind of you know getting some some more clarity there. Um, and Luis from the audience actually had a very specific question, um, mm. and I will put this out here for whoever feels uh, uh, you know they can get comfortable taking it. It's um, would ICA recommend a startup to take on convertible debt notes? at a pre-seed stage, even if the startup does not reach positive cash flow for the next 12 months? Awesome. Yeah, um, I can take that one. There's there's a, a number of instances where, you know, you're post-revenue and generating, you have customer relationships, you have a product launched and you, you've got some revenue, but you're not necessarily profitable and, and you don't have positive cash flow, but there's still value in taking a convertible debt note or a safe note. Um, uh, safe note is is simple agreement for future equity. It's similar to a convertible note, and it's one of the ways that um, ICA uses um, when when we invest in companies. Um, and I think those are yeah, I think those are very suitable. Um, you know, a safe note has has no interest and no maturity date. It just uh, becomes equity at the next financing round. So especially for really early stage companies that don't have a valuation, for instance that don't have positive cash flow yet, but still have a specific use of proceeds and, and could do great things with this with the capital uh, from a return perspective, um, then, then a convertible note or a safe note makes a lot of sense. Please. And I'll just mention the, uh, um, you know, on the, the ICA runs two labs per year and two accelerators per year. And so currently, um, you know, Diana's team is in the middle of, of the lab and the accelerator, but, but um, there will be open enrollment and, and applications for, you know, the second half of the year um, for the lab and, and the second accelerator. Thanks, John. I was going to, I saw programs. that in the, in the chat. Yeah, I saw that in the chat. Yeah. So um, we finished with our current lab uh, cohort at the end of April and our current accelerator cohort at the end of June. And so we are somewhere between July and August going to start both cohorts and we run them simultaneously because we do an application, one application for all of our programs and the program team based on application and interview, we then pick where people best fit. Um, and if it's a program that they want it to be in, but we think it's a better fit the other way, we will have that conversation. We just won't be like, you get accepted to this and not that thing. So we'll have that conversation. Um, and we do one pitch event a year and it's going to be in November this year. So folks who go through our programs have the opportunity to apply to pitch, to be able to pitch in front of investors. And the investment team helps us make sure that we have investors in the room and it's our 25th year anniversary this year. So it's going to be extra special. Oh, well, that's very exciting. Um, and Louise, hopefully that answered your, oh, yes, you said, thanks for clarifying. So thank you so much, John, for, for adding additional clarity there and for Diana and, and, and Willis for mentioning these programs that we have as well. Uh, or that you have as well, um, so that, that that they have you know places to turn to for these types of questions, which I think are very overwhelming for for founders. They sometimes they overwhelm me, and I, they're you know it's not even talking about a company that I have, you know, to talk about these different nuances and how to grow and 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 scale. So um, we appreciate that clarity, uh, Diana. Um, question to you, um, and then of course to the whole panel. 
what types of startups or industries would you like to see brought to fruition? So what are you seeing maybe some, some industries that you'd like to see grow more um, or some new things, uh, new problems you'd like to see addressed in the near future um, as a call for startups who are in, maybe in the audience right now? I'm super interested in telehealth, especially with everything that started going on with um, COVID and shelter in place. And telehealth was always a part of the landscape. But what's been happening over the last year is really, really exciting because it is still dependent on people um, and technology. So I'm always really excited about the things that are inter the people and technology parts are interrelated as opposed to just a pure technology where it's I just want to get to the fastest, biggest company I can with the least amount of labor spend, which is not as exciting for me because people make really great companies. So I'm really excited in telehealth. I would love to see more of that. And um, B2B services are really amazing. I think people underplay how awesome they can be. And, and it, um, but if you look at some of our, like the biggest corporations we have in the United States, most of them are B2B. So I like B2B a lot. And it's just like, if it's in a mature industry, is it a product that's changing the way or service that you're changing the delivery of it, or it's reinvigorating a stagnant industry. So those things are always really cool. So like there's so much coffee, but are you doing something different um, in coffee? There's so much food. Are you doing something different in the way that you're preparing, say like your, your vegan based meat product? So those are, those are exciting things for me. I love that. Willis, John, any, any uh, industries you're super excited about as well? I mean, I, I, I'll just brag on some of the founders and entrepreneurs that we, we have now. I mean, there's this alternative protein company. It's an insect snack company that uh, Monica Martinez founded uh, called Don Bugito. And it's just fascinating. And it's like pioneering the alternative protein market through insects, um, cricket flour and, and chocolate covered crickets and things like this. And it's, it's fascinating to kind of launch a product into a brand new industry and kind of build it from scratch and educate, um, you know, from scratch essentially. So that that's that's always um, you know fascinating to me. Um, Something better foods is an alternative um, fried chicken product uh, that uses um, soy and garbanzo beans, and it's a fascinating product and it's a recent investment. And again, it's kind of like Impossible Foods and in, 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 in those, it's it's pioneering and you know a new product into market. So those are always fascinating to me, and um, you know we, we we love to see that. You guys covered all the great ones. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I have to give a shout out. Our CEO just met with Madam Vice President, um, VP Harris, and one of our portfolio companies, Red Door Catering. And the founder and CEO of that company, Rain Free, um, got to speak um, with, with Madam Vice President. And, and it was just a great, uh, this was just last week. She was in Oakland for this. And um, so if you haven't seen that, maybe, maybe you could check it out, but it just goes to the, kind of the resilience and, and, and some of these things that we've been talking about today, as far as the future of investing and the role that CDFIs like us can play with these entrepreneurs. Man, see, John, you guys, I can't follow up. You guys, you guys are coming in <laughs> strong. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll throw in two more little, little darts in there. Um, I'm very passionate about issues that, that, that um, affect underrepresented, underserved uh, communities. So I'm very interested in education, education tech, you know, what happens to all the, the little ones that are out of school right now? How do they rebound? Um, what businesses are looking to solve that problem? And then another thing with, we talk about equity, ownership, wealth creation, uh, fintech, um, unique things in that, that space um, and, and um, are interesting to me as well, or not, maybe not full fintech, but that is included, but also like other things addressing uh, the financial knowledge, security of um, unrepresented, underfunded, underserved communities. Absolutely. And there's so much that's happening in all of these wonderful spaces you mentioned from, you know, telehealth to, you know, unique proteins to uh, financial inclusion and financial inclusion, you know, looks like so many different things. Actually, at the end of the day, it could be, you know, a, a, a different mm -hmm. group that you're helping bring into the conversation, mm -hmm. um, education you're providing, you know, a, a service that opens doors um, and, and just thinks about things in a completely different way to this point, mm -hmm. right? Like something that exists that, you know, doesn't mean there's not room for, for innovation. Um, and so I, I think it's awesome. So um, uh, we have one other, one last question from the chat before we wrap up for today, which is um, Maya asks, uh, what are you looking for in your investor partnerships? 
Um, and I think what she's, she's thinking about here is mission alignment, right? So um, that mission impact alignment, what does that look like for investor partnerships for ICA? Willis, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll start it. John is a great person to cover a piece of this as well. Um, but uh, so in our investment partners, of course, here it goes again, uh, mission alignment uh, committed to, to closing the racial and gender uh, equity and, and wealth gap, very important to us. We also consider ourselves to be very patient and, and kind capital. Um, so we work with you. We have no no interest in, you know, making you repay that convertible note or, you know, enforcing these wild things, seizing your assets or anything, anything like that. That's just not how we, um, what we think is right in regards to su supporting our, our companies. Um, so and we look for people who feel the same way. Uh, we work with a lot of foundations. We do work with a lot of other, you know, impact funds and, and different VCs throughout the Bay Area. Um, and they all kind of feel the same way is that we want to support the businesses through and through. And sometimes uh, we have to provide uh, advising and resources in addition to capital to help them grow. Um, but we look for companies that are willing to do that same thing and work alongside us in that. John, Diana. Yeah, I think that's right on, Willis. Um, you know, we, we have foundations and endowments and family offices that are mission aligned with us and, and they um, allow us to then fund our entrepreneurs and, and, and founders. Um, and then we also, I mean, a big part of what we do is also if we're funding a company, we help find other capital sources and other capital partners um, so that um, more proceeds can be raised. And I think that's also an important thing to, to leverage the, the, the capital that we provide into other capital sources. And, and we have a lot of partners that we work with in that regard. Fantastic. And hopefully that clarifies um, or answers your question, Maya. And I just want to put one more question out to the panel. We'll start with you, Diana, which is advice for founders. Uh, as they're going through your work, you, you have all worked with founders at so many different stages and so many different, um, in so many different ways and support them in so many different ways. What is the biggest piece of advice you can give to founders right now um, uh, regarding, you know, just perseverance, et cetera, how to keep going, things like that, Diana? Yeah, for sure. I'm just seeing if my child is going to keep yelling. He stopped so I can answer. Oh, no, John's going to go first. No. <laughs> John, any advice for founders um, uh, as they as they depart from how, us today? And yeah, how long do we have? We have another hour, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, in the next minute, um, you know, I just think uh, keep believing in yourself. You know, keep believing in yourself. I think that's really important. And there's going to be struggles and and along the way, especially you know this past year. With the COVID crisis, we saw a lot of companies go through a real, real trough and, and, and are just coming out of it now. So, um, you know, just to encourage everyone uh, in, in that regard. And I'll add something I'm sure Diana was going to add, which is to tap into your, your ecosystem, the network around you. And if not, look for resources online that can be um, helpful in your journey. And, you know, if, if all else fails, reach out to one of us and we'll definitely try to point, point you in the right direction. The thing I was going to add is never be afraid to ask for help. Always, always, always. You don't have to know everything. Just ask for help. It's totally fine. That's amazing advice. Uh, and 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 that brings us to a close for today. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for you know and asking questions, being active in the chat. We really appreciate you being here. But most importantly, thank you to this amazing panel we had from ICA, Diana, John, Willis. It has truly been fun uh, hanging out with you and 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 talking about investments and in startups today. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Uh, and, um, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Okay.